One of those questions that every developer comes across at some point in their journey is probably, how do I become a more senior developer? How do I transition from a junior developer into a senior developer? And while that on its own is a large question and uh, definitely too much for this short video, uh, one of the things that I think should be present on a, on a more senior developer, something that I think that you should strive for if you want to become more senior, is the way you use Git or your version control system. And by this, I don't necessarily mean your technical Git skills, like how good you are with the Git command line tool. That's certainly important too. But what I mean here is the output, what your coworkers see. And that's why I've labeled this video a bit of Git etiquette, how to make your coworkers happy, be ready for continuous deployment and grow as a developer. As you might know, I started this channel as a side project, which also means I have to have something like a main project. And if you didn't know, I'm a freelance developer. My clients are sometimes enterprise companies, sometimes they're small businesses, but whether they're small or, or big, um, usually the, the code I build for them is closed sourced and uh, we can't take a look at it. There are NDAs that you sign, but every once in a while you come across a project where uh, the customer or the client decides to open source their code, which in turn means that everything that I build for this current client is also open source and that I can use it as examples for um, my YouTube channel. And here I'd like to start with this example of how I make Git commits, how I structure them and why I think that is a good idea. So let's go to a pull request that I submitted. First of all, the project that I'm talking about is called Viviate, which is a distributed knowledge graph, which is really, really awesome. And I'll definitely make a separate video about that. But right now it's just about how I structured my commits in pull requests. So the first thing you notice scrolling down here is probably that there's quite a lot of them. So if you scroll down, there's, I didn't count them, but for a relatively small feature, um, this is this is uh, quite a number of commits. So they should be small. The number, of course, itself doesn't say anything, but I try to keep them small. However, having a small on its own uh, doesn't really benefit you at all. What I also try to do, and what you all should definitely see here, is write good commit messages. And there's two parts to a commit message. One is what the message does. So this is the, the tagline, which in this case, uh, okay, don't return a thunk for the specific um, thing here. Upgrade go GraphQL, return thanks, try to improve, resolve network references, only query a uh, peer if user wants to, to uh, wants classes from this peer and so on. So it's very, very clear if you read the message, what this individual commit does. It's formulated in present imperative tense, meaning that if you apply this commit, it will make sure that it only queries the peer if the user wants to class from this peer. So basically, this is an instruction to whoever is reviewing this um, pull request or who's looking through commits. Okay, if you apply this commit to your trunk, this is what will change in our software. And that's the first important thing to make that clear. However, um, I think on this part, a lot of people are, are still, still do this because they've heard at some point that they need to write good commit messages. But then the second part is the motivation. So as you've seen, I've already opened up all of these commits here. If I close them again, uh, that might be more common to some of you. These commits have motivations. So um, if you open them up, you see this text here that tells you why I did what I did in this commit. And I'll give you an example in a second of why I think this is really, really helpful. But before we, before we go into the motivation part, another thing that you should see here is these green tick marks. So on GitHub, this means in this case, we're using Travis for our CI. This means that the CI has run on every one of those commits. It hasn't run on this one because I think I pushed two at a time here. So if you push uh, two at a time, it'll only run for the latest. But nevertheless, the important thing is that every single build was green. And this means in turn that every single one of those commits was mergeable. And by mergeable, it also was deployable. And this is a very, very core principle of continuous delivery and in turn continuous deployment. We want to continuous delivery, be able to deploy every commit or continuous deployment. We want to actually deploy every commit. So um, this means that I have certain discipline before creating a commit. I'll make sure all the tests are green. I have run all the tests locally before I even push this. 
And this means that not only can we release this at any time, if someone else is depending on this code, they can merge this in whatever way they want, but also if you're looking at, at this or trying to go back in history, you know that you'll always have a working code base. And this is very, very important. Of course, if you merge it at, let's say, this point, the feature is not complete because it hasn't been completed yet. But whatever you have in this point works and we're making sure that it doesn't break any existing thing. So that is very important as well. So let me get to an example of why I think the motivation in a commit message is so important. I've opened up this very, very small um, file here. And um, this is also from, from the VV8 project that I'll talk about in another time. And if you take a look uh, at this line here, on its own, it's pretty boring. It uh, just seems to be some sort of a function that doesn't return anything. Um, if we do a git blame on this, and this is why I think the commit message is so important. If we do a git blame, you'll see that, oh, I changed this here. Okay, let's see what I changed here. So let's look at this difference. Okay, ah, this is a pretty small difference. So here it used to return a function that could return an empty interface. So empty interface in Golang means just anything really. Um, and now it just returns the empty interface and not in a function. So it used to return a thunk. A thunk is used to uh, for deferred execution. So instead of returning your results, you return a function that when being called will return your results, which gives you the ability to be in control of when you wanna call this. So it seems like I removed this here. If you just have this kind of information and nothing else, you'd probably go like, what the fuck? Why, why would he remove that thunk? But let's take a look at our commit message here. Okay, no longer return thunk in connector to the local get meta. This on its own, pretty good already. At least we know it was a conscious decision and not a mistake, but this is now where it gets interesting. Let me just read this out. The original intent of the thunks was to enable parallelism. We want to keep this idea, but the thunk can always be created in the GraphQL.resolve method in the GraphQL API package. The connectors do not have to know of the concept of thunks. Their concern should simply be to resolve based on the given input. So what I did is move this. So I moved this to another place. And this was a very conscious decision. This was an architectural decision because I decided, okay, this database connector should not be aware that stuff is happening in parallel. This should be happening at a higher level. And this, I think, is one of those examples when you come across a commit message where you think, huh, okay, very good, very glad that there was motivation involved. So let's get quickly get back to the browser. Here's another example just to, to show you with all green commits, um, all, all green CI builds. And um, just, yeah, I wanted to include this as well. Nobody's perfect. Um, here I screwed up. Here in this case, um, I did actually actually break the build at some point. So yeah, that happens, it happens to the best of us. In this case, I simply forgot um, a missing file, added a new file. My test locally was green, but I never did the git add, never included the file. So of course, uh, see, I was broken and it took me embarrassingly long to figure out. So keep that in mind as well. Even if you're trying to strive for best practices, nobody's perfect and mistakes are absolutely okay. They happen. So let me get back to my title screen here. Um, Two things that I wanted to, to mention, sort of a channel update. Uh, first of all, I haven't been able to create a lot of videos as of lately, but I wanted to get into, into more videos again. Um, the focus uh, has been a bit uh, only on Docker and Kubernetes in the previous videos, but I want to touch more topics, software engineering in general, all these DevOps topics that, that cross. And also because it's just simply a passion of mine, I also want to uh, uh, release videos about React every once in a while, so a bit of front-end stuff. And I thought one of the cool uh, starting projects could just be this very simple title screen that I uh, generated here. So if you take a look at this, this is just a very, very, very simple React app. And um, I built this in, in half an hour on the couch. And I thought I could rebuild this for a video because uh, this might be a good good uh, opportunity to learn something about React. So let me know if you're interested in this and also in general about more uh, videos about methods and about how we work and these kind of things and not just technical tutorials because I think that's also a very important part of being a developer, being a software engineer, being a DevOps engineer, whatever you are. Uh, it's not just about writing code, it's also about communicating, working in a team and uh, these kind of things. So until then, have a great time and see you soon.